Thanks so much for having me here and thanks for that introduction, Patrick. Um, so I, I can tie this talk to the anthrop Anthropocene in a number of ways, but mostly I will not do that. I will just talk, talk the talk, and we will look at the history and some of the politics of knowledge about global climate change. Um, you have all seen this news recently. 2014 was the warmest year in the modern record, according to a couple of the major data centers. This one is, uh, this is a graph from NASA. The warming of the Earth since 1950, uh, the temperature trend since then, warming everywhere, except in Antarctica. And I really like to show this little video, which gives you most of our observational data about the climate since the 1880s in 26 seconds. You can see it slowly changing, especially as we get into the last 30 or 40 years. You've seen this too. These are the emissions scenarios of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, there are many things on this graph. RCP, representative concentration pathway, somewhat obscure term, used to be called a scenario for climate change. Essentially, what they're doing, what they're showing here is that in time, uh, it, on the business as usual scenario, the temperature rising up to about four degrees by 2100, four degrees higher than the 20th century average. Uh, on a much more optimistic, High technology, low, high policy pathway, uh, lots of renewables, we might manage to keep it flat. Northern Hemisphere's September sea ice going down on many scenarios, uh, disappearing completely in the summer by the middle of this century. And finally, surface temperature change in, by the end of the 21st century sea ice, again, disappearing in the summer uh, in the Arctic. So that's the news, the recent news. And I want to talk today about some of the history of that news, how we know that, and how we know that we know it. <coughs> I'm going to put this in the framework of changes in the way we know things, in the, in the infrastructures we have for digesting information and turning it into knowledge. I'll talk a little bit about the history of climate data, then I'm going to talk a, a fair bit about metadata, which is data about data, or uh, maybe a description of data would be a better way of saying it. And then we'll look at some controversies about climate data that have happened in the last 15 years and connect that to the changing of knowledge infrastructures. So let me talk about this idea for a minute first. What's a knowledge infrastructure? What I mean by that is systems that have become robust and reliable for producing knowledge about the world that we generally take for granted. I mean, things that are infrastructure, like the wire, the wall, the building, you just ignore it most of the time. You assume that it's there. You assume that it's going to work. Doesn't always work. Sometimes they break, but mostly they don't. That's what, how you know that something is an infrastructure. Knowledge infrastructures do that with people, with instruments, with uh, computers, and with institutions that endure over long periods. And good examples of these are things like the National Census, uh, Centers for Disease Control, and especially the weather forecast system. It's a good example with, re with respect to climate change because, of course, weather forecasts are not always reliable, and yet we use them all the time. So, here in California, I mean, I've lived here for 15 years. I know the drill. There's, on the coast, you don't have to think about the weather very much. Where I live, you have to think about it a lot. In Michigan, it was minus 17 last week. Uh, you need to know that before you go out the door. And so you look at the weather forecast, and mostly you believe it. I mean, if it says it's going to be minus 17, you're going to put on a big coat, and you're going to put on a hat, and all that stuff. You trust it, even though you know it might be wrong by a few degrees here. So let me remind you, uh, for some of you, this is old news because you were there. For younger people, this may not be 
you may not be totally obvious, uh, scientific traditions have changed over time. It used to be the case that there were these kind of pyramids of expert authority, and you became an expert based on your reputation, which was a combination of your pedigree, so who educated you, where you went to school, the kind of thing you learned, uh, your performance in terms of publication and prestige, and peer review, so what other experts thought about your work. In that somewhat distant world, data belonged to you, and so did your code. They were your work products, and mostly you did not show those to anyone else. You would show them the synthesis of your results. You would draw a graph, you would uh, make, make a, uh, other kinds of figures that demonstrated what it was, what your data said, and you would show them some of the numbers but in many cases, data sets are very large. There are lots of numbers, and they would, if they were published on paper, they would have occupied many pages, and no one would have ever used them. So for the most part, uh, they were things that you just couldn't publish or didn't publish because that was the tradition. How then did you know that things were, that results were correct? You knew it because other people vetted the work, other experts. They did that not only in terms of journal publishing, which we all know about, but also all kinds of steps along the way. So talking about it with other scientists, uh, giving presentations <coughs> about it, sending letters, sharing drafts, working it up until it was felt to be uh, adequate uh, in terms of your, the quality of your knowledge. So data and code in that distant world could be reviewed. Sometimes reviewers would ask to see those things but mostly they didn't. Today, of course, all that has changed, and we publish everything. <coughs> or at least we can publish everything. We don't always do that. And some people think that this is a revolution and a really important step that we will now be able to do all kinds of new things with data and code, especially uh, learning about all kinds of ideas, intuitions, crackpot theories that might be true, uh, experiments that someone might do sometime, but I'm not going to do it, so I'll publish it on the web and somebody else might pick it up, things like that. Another idea is that because there are so many people who might be interested in any given area, that you can use the pockets of expertise uh, in coding, in math, in observing other kinds of systems to uh, solicit help from the rest of the world to build better knowledge. So the cognitive surplus idea. So let me talk a little bit about the history of weather forecasting. This is a weather map from 1872. And it's uh, hard to see, I know, but the, you can see there's a high pressure zone here. There are lines of constant pressure, called ISO lines, ISO bars here and here, and at a few spots, such as this tiny little spot, you see a data point. Mostly, this map is not drawn from data. It is drawn from theory and some, uh, a few scattered observations. The interest of it to us today is that it looks very much like a modern weather map. The same techniques, isobars, isolines, uh, ocean currents, are still part of our uh, practice. The weather forecast system uh, began in, in the middle of the 19th century to, with, with a, uh, first really systematic observations on ships and then spread to land stations. The big revolution in weather forecast was the telegraph because that allowed people to share observations simultaneously or more or less in real time. You know, this is an example of a graph drawn from the, from the telegraph. Um, they, this was the first time that, that data really became useful for forecasting in, in, uh, in weather science because it was the first time you could get data before the weather moved. So this gives you the chance to make a synoptic picture of what's going on all over the place, uh, more or less in real time. And in th maps like these were shared by facts, which, yes, did exist in the 19th century. Uh, they were published in newspapers, um, they were distributed to 
weather service offices all over the country and used to a degree for, as forecasts. Since they did not have a very good theory of why weather did what it did, mostly these forecasts were not useful beyond about 36 hours. Yeah. <coughs> coverage begins to evolve, and in the 1870, Europe is pretty well covered, the East Coast of North America, but you know, by 1900, you see most of the Northern Hemisphere, and by 1960, most of the land masses of the world. Uh, you have to take these, these maps with a grain of salt because the radius around each of these weather stations, the radius of the circle is 1,000 kilometers, so it's really a, you know, one weather station standing in for a very large area. And in California, of all places, you know that it's not really like that. All the <coughs> But this is still you know, pretty good uh, coverage. So the idea that you could forecast the weather with equations, with math, came in around the turn of the 20th century. And by the time of the First World War, Lewis Richardson had developed this idea of how you would do this, how you would make a weather forecast mathematically using human computers. So what you're seeing here is a kind of gigantic spherical stadium. And these are rows of people. And he thought that with each one of them is representing a little piece of the atmosphere over that area of land. And they are all sitting there with hand calculators, madly calculating away and entering their results on forms, which they then pass on to the next person as the weather moves. And Richardson thought that with 64,000 computers, human computers, you might be able to calculate the weather a little bit faster than it actually happens. This guy up in the center here is a conductor, and he's got, a, he's got colored lights, and he's waving around. <coughs> Africa, you're moving too fast. <laughs> North America, go, go slower. You're, you're, you're getting in the way of everything. So this idea came in. Richardson tried it himself. He had an elaborate system of computing forms, which would allow you to you know, do the math as a, as a series of uh, uh, simple calculations. He tried using his own forms. It took him six weeks to make one forecast for a single eight-hour period over a small part of uh, Europe. And it was a massive failure. It was a massive failure because of mathematical problems that he did not know about and that actually no one really understood until later after uh, digital computing came in, but the effect of this exercise was that people knew it could be done, but they did not actually try it again until digital computers came in. So they just didn't have the math power, they didn't understand what was going on with the discrete math. So they had other ways of making forecasts, but not this. In the 50s, uh, as the first digital computers came in, one of the very first things they were applied to was weather forecasts. And the system that they developed uh, it, at that time was very much like the system that Richardson had invented in the, uh, during the war, the First World War. It simply it carves up the atmosphere into a set of grid boxes. Each grid box uh, has uh, variables for mass, energy, momentum, other factors like humidity and, and so on. And on a time step, each grid box calculates its transfers to the neighboring grid boxes, and then you move on to the next time step. So in a modern weather model, those time steps can be very short, as little as five minutes or, or less, because the grid boxes have gotten quite small in weather forecast models. Uh, in a climate model, so, a weather model starts from initial observations. It starts from what it's reading, from, from data about the atmosphere, and then moves it forward in time. In a climate model, that's not quite what happens. A climate model takes the physical forces that govern the movement of the atmosphere and applies them to this simulated atmosphere, and they then run it for a simulation of 20 or 30 years until it develops its own stable climate state. And then they run it forward, and they change things about it that might uh, influence the climate, and uh, use the statistics of its behavior as a representation of a climate. Lots of processes have been added to these models. They started with really nothing more than kind of radiation and precipitation and a couple of other things, carbon dioxide. Today, many other things are in there. 
clouds, uh, ocean circulation, super important in the climate system, and lots of other stuff. I'm happy to talk about it more later, but going somewhere else with this right now. So in the 60s, this, uh, the weather forecast systems that had started as National Weather Services really became unified into a world weather forecast system that is still in, you know, active today. This is where we get all our weather information. It's called the World Weather Watch. There are sensors of many kinds in space, in the air, uh, on the ground, at sea, buoys, satellites, thermometers, lots of other stuff. They send information uh, now through the internet, but previously through uh, telephone and other systems. Uh, they send them to a few central uh, calculating centers, such as uh, the National, the, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. Those places do you know, crunch the numbers, they produce a forecast for the whole globe, and they then send those data out to the National Weather Services, which refine them and maybe change them for local conditions and produce forecasts that you then use. So the point about this is that it's very old. And this goes back to the middle of the 19th century. Uh, in, in this form, it goes back to the 1960s. It's very well established, and it has been through many cycles of revision and improvement. So the models that are used in weather forecasting in ECMWF, they've been through, at this point, probably about 50 cycles of revision. And each time, what they will do is they'll take the existing model and then the new model, and they'll run them together at the same time for about six months and see which one does better. And only after the new model has shown that it can be, do a better job than the previous model, is it replaced. So I said a minute ago that weather forecasting starts from data, but that's not exactly true. And this is an interesting point, at least to me. So they take in observations all the time from all those data sources. But each forecast actually doesn't start with the data. It starts with the previous forecast. Because part of what goes on when weather moves is that there are, you know, there are parts of the world where we have a lot of information, a lot of weather stations or buoys or uh, radio signs. And then there are other parts, especially in the southern oceans, where there's not much information. Because we just don't have, there aren't, aren't many islands. It's mostly water. Um, there's no, no, nowhere to get that information. So the way they talk about it is that the weather forecast model moves information from areas with a lot of it to areas where there's less of it. So when the next round of forecasting starts, you know, eight hours later, or 12 hours later, or whatever it is, the weather has moved, and the information that you had about the high information place is now moved to the place where you have less of it. So you then use observations to correct the values of that previous forecast and move on. So a, a more kind of interesting way to say this is that most of the data in a modern weather forecast is actually created by the simulation, not drawn from observations. Now this works. Um, and we know it works because we can see over time, you know, here's 1955, the first computer weather forecasting, and here we are today, and over time, bigger and bigger computers and better and better models, and we see that you know, here between 1970-something and uh, 1986 or so, a period of about 15 years, the uh, the 72-hour forecast is now as good as the 36-hour forecast was 15 years previously. And it keeps on going up. Now, it isn't perfect, and it's actually important to know that even though this is said to be a percentage of a perfect forecast, what that means is a forecast for the 500 millibar level, which is about 10 uh, kilometers up in the atmosphere, so it's quite high and not, not what's going on the ground. That's more complicated. Still, it's doing a very good job. So that's what, what I'm talking about when I say 
it's a knowledge infrastructure. It's robust, it's widely accepted, it's old, it, it has a lot of stability. All right. Um, I guess I have a hard end point here, so I, I was going to invite questions, but now I think I won't. So let me talk about climate data a little bit. Of course, first of all, what's the difference between weather and climate? Most of you understand this, I'm sure. You know, weather bounces around all the time. We have lots of extreme events, both up and down. These are data from an airport station, and you see you know, daily high and low, this is temperature. And you see that you know, over time, it gets warmer in the summer, amazingly enough. It gets colder in the winter. And yet, we have moments when the weather is outside the average, either up or down. So another way to say this is that climate is what we expect. The seasons are climatic. Weather is what we get. You know, the extreme events, sometimes really unusual, but it's gonna be very rare to have a temperature high like that at this season. Now the climate is varies naturally. There are lots of things going on and many systems involved that all have their own circulations and rhythms. You know, when we talk about climate warming, you might think of it as being something like this, but it's not because it has to, it combines with variability that would be there anyway, no matter what else happened. So what we see is a trend over time, but it bounces around and extremes in both directions are normal. How do we know anything about the climate? Well, there are different ways of knowing, and in science, there are really four major ways right now. One is from data, just look, see what happens. Another is from theory, this is the explanation for what happens, uh, often idealized. Then there are experiments, and that for a long time was the major mode of science, and really, people thought of that as being what science is about, the whole idea of an experiment is that you find some way to simplify a situation and hold lots of other things constant while you change one thing. Then you can see what the effect of that variable is on everything else. In the case of the climate, you can't really do that because there's no control Earth. You know, we can't hold one Earth constant while we change another Earth. Not in reality, but what we can do is simulate it. So the point of a climate model is to give, make it possible for us to see what would happen in other conditions than the ones we have. And also to see what would have happened in the past had we not done what we have done to the atmosphere. So for a climate scientist, simulations are an experimental tool. Here are some results from those experiments. So these are graphs from the fourth IPCC assessment report from 2007. I'm not using the more recent ones because these uh, graphs are clearer and there's a similar graph in the newer report that, that's just harder to read. So what's going on here? We have simulations. So the black lines in both these graphs are what actually happened across the 20th century. We then take the climate models and we try to make them simulate that. Now you don't expect it to simulate the exact variability that happened because a model has its own climate. It is like <coughs> Earth's climate, but it is not identical to it. Um, you then put in the greenhouse gases that we put into the atmosphere and you put them in historically as, the, as that actually happened. So you change the concentrations year by year as the record shows that that did occur. And you get this, these yellow lines, which are 58 simulations from 14 different models. These, this, these simulations have both the natural forcings, like volcanoes, which are these uh, lines where there's a rapid cooling in the atmosphere, and the human ones. And you see that the, you know, the, the yellow lines bounce around a lot. They're not quite the same as the actual ones, but here, where you get a, a major volcanic eruption, everything cools, including the average of these models. 
And here with Pinatubo and, and others, you also get that dip. So it doesn't look identical. The red average is not the same, but it's following the same basic line. Down here, you have the same thing, except that they're not doing any anthropogenic forcing at all. So this is the 20th century as it might have happened had we not been around. And what you see is that, that none of the models, especially this part of the century, which is when most of the greenhouse gases went in, um, none of the models can reproduce the actual trend without the anthropogenic force. So this is the same graph. This is from the uh, fifth assessment report, the 2013 report. Again, they've kind of made it more hard to read, so just why I didn't show it before. But if you look down here, these are the global averages. Same thing. Black line is observations. The pink is simulations with anthropogenic forcing. The blue is simulations without anthropogenic forcing. And you can't get the same result for the globe. You can't get it for the land and ocean together. You can't get it for ocean heat content without the anthropogenic forcing. And in most of these cases, most of the continents, they're now drilling down to a lower, you know, a higher resolution, a smaller scale. Um, you can't get the same result even over each continent without the anthropogenic forcing. One exception is Antarctica. OK. Now, a little bit of data history. So I really like this graph because I'm a historian. And this is a historical graph. You know, we have different data sets about the global climate starting from 1881. And you know, of course, they end wherever those investigators stopped. I have a whole bunch of them from the middle of the 20th century. And you see that there are some really big differences here. You know, this difference is very large. So what's going on there with Will in 1950 versus all these others? And this difference is very large. The black line is the most recent one at the time. This was from around two, the 2007. <clears throat> so why are they so different, even though they kind of converge here? Well, there are lots of reasons for this. And it's important, the data detectives part is about this problem of figuring out why those graphs aren't the same. So here's an example. We have, this, these are precipitation gauges. And what you see here is time going left to right, and then these little stepwise jumps. What's happened is that here in each of these countries, at different times, they have adopted a new instrument, a new type of rain gauge or snow collector, and it's caused a slight change in the readings that are typically recorded. It's a different instrument. It has different characteristics. It's not making a mistake, it's just not the same type of instrument. And if you've ever done science with different instruments, you know that this is all, always happens. They have different characteristics. If you know about that, you can fix it, because you know what the difference is. But notice that it's happening in all these countries at different times. And sometimes it's a stepwise jump of a very large amount, like 20% here. Sometimes it goes down. You know, you've got to know this stuff in order to fix the data. These come from the National Climatic Data Center. The, the article was written by Tom Carl. Here he is with George Bush. I don't think that conversation went very well. But. <laughs> <laughs> so I like to talk about this as the friction involved in making data global. So we can collect data from all of them. But to really have global data that is usable as global data, we have to adjust it and make it all coherent. And that involves a lot of detective work. Here's another example. Different countries trying to calculate simply the average daily temperature. Now, that doesn't sound like it should be hard. You know, maximum plus minimum divided by two. Or readings four times a day divided by four or eight times a day divided by eight, or you know, any of these other things. And some of these places are, are using all these methods at the same time in different parts of the country. Some of them change methods over the course of the uh, period. There are lots of other examples like this. 
Now, the differences among these calculations are very small. And if you know about them, it's quite easy to correct for them. But if you don't know, you can't correct them. So a lot of what these data guys do in climate science is go back and look at every single weather station, every instrument, and find out about its characteristics and what happens to it over the course of the period they're trying to study, and then see if they can fix it. So back to the graph. Why do some numbers keep changing? Why are these graphs so uh, not identical? Well, one thing that's going on is that they didn't use a lot of stations in the past. Uh, the biggest one was calendar in 1961 and the four different chimney stations, largely because they would only typically shoot, use stations that had a long history that was very stable. Later, with computer modeling, they began to use more stations, partly because they could do this detective work and then calculate all the little fudging that had to happen to get the, the data from all these different types of instruments and so on into line, to make it more coherent. Recently, in 2012, we got the biggest one ever, which has almost 40,000 stations. Um, now, of course, most of these didn't exist in the distant past, they're more recent. But, um, so, you know, from this you can see why those graphs are changing a lot. Here's one more example of why knowing things about a station really matters. This is a station in Australia, Port Hedland in Australia, where the, the site before 1948 was near the coast, rather stable, and then they moved it to an airport. <laughs> now, it's still called the same thing. It's still the same station, but it's moved you know, <coughs> five kilometers, something like that, but it's moved inland, and it produces a different period. Again, if you know about it, you can fix it, but you have to know about it. So more recently, data sets that have been able to do all this detective work and go back and adjust have brought their readings more into line with each other. So these data sets were all created in the, in the, in the 21st century from those historical data, but independently, and they look a lot more like each other. OK, why does this matter? So now we'll talk about some uh, controversies that many of you may have heard about and some of you haven't. So let's talk about the hockey stick first. Who's heard of the hockey stick? Okay. Well, so the hockey stick was big feeder into the climate gate controversy I'll talk about in a minute. This cartoon came out right after climate gate during a big snowstorm in Washington. And this was the idea. Climate scientists are manipulating data. First, some background about the hockey stick. There used to be this thing called the medieval warm period. This was from an article by uh, Herbert Lamb from 1965. He, this graph is often reproduced. You can find it all over the World Wide Web. And what it seems to show is that there was a big warming period in the, around the, in the 1200s, 1300s. And then we dip into this thing, well-known period called the Little Ice Age. Uh, and then it comes back up. But the point that, that, that uh, people like to draw from this is that this temperature change here is about the same as the temperature change we had in the uh, last part of the 20th century. Now, did it happen? <laughs> I will take this over on my computer. <laughs> well, let's look at this. Central Anglo. 
talk about evidence that, that something like this might have happened in other parts of the world, but we can't really say for sure. And yet, the way the graph is reproduced here, you see, makes it look like this is the whole planet. And that's the way it's usually set. Um, so, that's background. 1999, Michael Mann and his colleagues uh, published this graph of temperature over the last 1,000 years. This was, so the red lines here are thermometers. So this is historical data. And then prior to that, it's all proxy data. So it's things that change, that are correlated with temperature, but are not, you know, they're not thermometers, so they're not as accurate. And uh, they include tree rings and ice cores and corals. And these gray lines here are error bars. So, of course, as you go further back in time, you have fewer data points and they're less reliable, so the error bars get very large. But now you see the medieval war period is gone. It's not here. It should be here somewhere. Where did they go? And this made certain people very suspicious. In particular, this guy, Steve McIntyre, and another guy named McKittrick. McIntyre, and now, now we're getting back to the theme of knowledge infrastructures. Right? So this, in the early 2000s, in the early days of blogging, which seems like ancient history to some of you, but was a new thing at the time, McIntyre started this blog called Climate Audit. McIntyre is a retired Canadian mining engineer. He is, uh, has a good head for mathematics and statistics. He knows his way around a spreadsheet. And he decided that uh, he was going to try to recalculate man's graph, because it just couldn't be right. You know, what happened to the medieval war period? So he began asking man for data. And the frame for this became the idea of an audit. So the idea is, if you're a corporation, and you have, uh, at the end of the year, you have to have your books audited. And that's to show that you didn't do something fishy with your money uh, and take value away from your shareholders. Now, you can't be audited by someone who works for you because that would be corrupt. So McIntyre says, by analogy, climate scientists should be audited by people who are not climate scientists. Because it may be the case that every, everybody involved in peer review is just kind of buddying up. You know, I'm going to, I like you, so I'm going to approve your work. Or I don't want to offend you, so I'm going to approve your work. So this, this blog became very, very popular. And uh, it, among other things, he began to publish their uh, studies and claims about the hockey stick graph. And that debate became very ac acrimonious. So there's McIntyre and Michael Mann with his tree rings. McIntyre asked for Mann's data. So remember, he's not a scientist. He's not a climate scientist. Smart guy, but not a climate scientist. Uh, Mann has a, shall we say, a complicated personality and did not uh, appreciate these requests and did not really want to fulfill them or see why he should. I mean, McIntyre was not a scientist. It was, there was no real reason for this. So he kind of posted his data on an FTP site and told McIntyre about it and just basically said, go figure it out. You, know, I'm not, you, you can have it, but I'm not going to help. Then McIntyre began to request his source code as well. So what, what did you do with your data analysis? I want to see it. And they escalated this all the way to the US House of Representatives where there was a hearing that demanded meant from man practically everything he had ever done, his CV, all his money, all the data for his work, source code, everything else. And it was then reviewed by many agencies, including NSF, the National Research Council, the AAAS, the National Academy of Sciences. So this was a very big deal. <coughs> now it should be said that McIntyre did find an error in man's math and in his statistical method. It's kind of a, it's an obscure point. Um, it's, it's a real error and it did change the result a little bit, but it did not change it a lot. 
Mann wrote a book about this in 2012. Uh, now, you know, benefit of hindsight, it must be said, but still, important things to, to think about here. So here's what Mann had to say about this. McIntyre didn't need our code because the code is just a computer representation of the math. And we publish the math, he can write his own code. Now, why should he get mine, which took me a lot of effort, and is my work product, again, old paradigm science. Our source code is our intellectual property. And then, I mean, again, benefit of hindsight, he says, source code today, but what would it be tomorrow? Maybe even private, private emails. <laughs> now, okay, well, let me finish up on this and we'll talk about uh, private emails. So the National Research Council reviewed this in 2006, and they, by then there were several other studies done by other groups that, you know, using independent methods and techniques, and you, know, you can see what the point of it is here. There is warming in this period in some of these graphs, so it's warmer than it is here in the Little Ice Age, um, but by the time you get up into the 20th century, it's gone far higher, and uh, the, the basic structure of the hockey stick curve is preserved. By the way, blade of the stick, hand of the stick. Okay, so that becomes background for the climate gate controversy that probably most of you know about. This is a very big part of that. Um, 2009, just before the COP15, conference of, 15th Conference of, of Parties to the Framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, somebody, a hacker, we're not really sure, maybe an insider, uh, published about 5,000 emails and a lot of data that had been collected by this thing called the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia in the UK. Um, the emails were carefully combed, and they had obviously actually been selected, you know, so it wasn't just that all the email was published. Somebody knew this story from the inside and had gone through it and published a certain set of emails. Now the background of this goes back to McIntyre because in 2005, the, uh, the UK got its Freedom of Information Act, so kind of like ours. At that point, any government agency could basically, you know, was legally required to respond to requests for information, and people began requesting it from the Climatic Research Unit. So in that year, 105 requests came in for things like data and other information. 58 of them were from McIntyre. And, you know, we in academia are usually on the sending end of a FOIA request. If you're on the receiving end, it's quite a bit of work. You know, you've got to collect all this stuff, you have to have it vetted by lawyers. There's a, you know, it's a lot of effort. So they didn't like this, and they kind of developed this bunker mentality. And uh, that resulted in some of these emails. So here's Phil Jones center of this scandal, one of the data guys. And he's saying, I'm getting hassled to release the CRU station temperature data. Don't any of you three tell anybody that the UK has a Freedom of Information Act. Well, good. Here's another one, and this was the most famous email on the set. So man, Jones writes this line. I've just completed Mike's nature trick, that's nature of the scientific journal, Adding in the real temps to each series for the last 20 years, and from 1961 for Keith Griffiths, to hide the decline. Now, this was widely interpreted in the blogosphere as being about a decline in global temperature that they were trying to hide. The nature trick referred to what man had done in the hockey stick graph of putting, using temperature, measured temperatures from thermometers along with proxy data. But the thing is, the thermometers are the standard for the proxy data. So it's not like the proxy data could show a decline in temperature that is the real temperature curve. The thermometers could be showing the wrong one. So there's no epistemological problem here. Um, the decline in question, in fact, refers to something that happened with tree rings. Uh, since the, around 1960, 
the relationship between tree rings and temperature has <coughs> come unglued. And people don't totally understand why. Before that, it's a very good proxy record. After that, it becomes less good. And uh, it may be due to increasing uh, levels of particulate matter in the atmosphere that diminish the amount of light reaching trees. So photosynthesis not working quite as well, but nobody quite understands this yet. So, backing up a step to something I said earlier, so metadata. Right? Typically, when we talk about metadata, uh, people think in terms of uh, you know, what type of instrument was used, when the data were recorded, where it was done, you know, very basic information about something. But you could also think of email as metadata. It's information about what people did with data. So it is also potentially a source of valuable knowledge. And one way to read this controversy is that the, the, the quest for these emails to release them is about that in the new world of knowledge that we have now. So Inhofe, now head of our environment committee, says that these are uh, criminal. Failing to release these may be not only unethical, but possibly illegal. These are federal employees. They, are, they have to release their data. Why did they do this? Is it possible that the CRU really did manipulate data in an uh, illegitimate way? Well, we've got other data sets calculated by other data centers using independent uh, systems and techniques. And they look pretty much exactly the same. So these are different curves, but if we overlaid them, they would look so similar that there would be very little difference. So they've been separated here to make them visible. This is the, the CRU data that were supposed to be manipulated. These are the de data from ECMWF, which has a larger set of stations and covers more of the northern hemisphere. And uh, it shows more warming than the CRU. So finally, on that point, and then I've got one other thing, and I'll, I'll stop. So it, it, this is a fascinating little story. So Richard Muller is a physicist at the University of California at Berkeley. Um, he's a very good physicist. He's not a climate scientist. And he had been a prominent skeptic uh, of climate change. He thought that there must be some problems, especially problems related to things like urban heat islands that were biasing our station readings to making it appear to get warmer when it's not really doing that. So he set out to build his own temperature data set. And he began, he hired some good statisticians, got a lot of money, some of it from the Koch brothers. Uh, and other, so, so other climate change skeptics basically said, whatever Mueller finds, we'll believe that. Notably, this guy named Anthony Watts, who will come back into this story. So Berkeley did this study. It's got the you know, 39,000 stations. And in April of 2010, before he had, no, 2011, before he had actually published these data, before they had been through peer review, Mueller was invited to uh, appear before Congress. I remember the, you know, the He's got this kind of audience of skeptics who uh, are waiting to hear what he's going to say. And he goes up before Congress and he says, we haven't finished our analysis yet, and maybe some things will change, but we've done a preliminary job, and basically our data looked like all the other data. So that was very disappointing. To this dude, Anthony Watts. Anthony Watts is a TV meteorologist, and he runs a blog called What's Up With That, that is one of the most widely read blogs in the world of any kind, and especially of, about weather and climate. And he started, you know, so he's got a huge audience, and he's a skeptic, and he thinks that, uh, you know, the, especially the US 
station temperature data are, are biased, warmed by heat island effects and other problems. So he decided to do a study. And I think this is just a totally fascinating story. So he puts up on his blog this project, surfacestations.org, and he says, here's the manual for evaluating a weather station from the National Weather Service. I want you volunteers, anybody, to go out and survey your local weather station and take pictures and fill out this report according to the National Weather Service standards and tell us what you find. So they reviewed almost all of the stations in the uh, historical climatology network that we use here in the States for the, our, our climate. Here he is. Now, in 2009, before this was really finished, he published a report about this. And you see that it says, how do we know global warming is a problem if we can't trust the US temperature record? Not a statement, it's a question, but there's an implication there. This report, by the way, is still near the top of his homepage, though the report has never been reviewed, peer reviewed. And Watts was one of those guys who went after Mueller as soon as he published it, as soon as he appeared before Congress and said, Why didn't they wait for peer review? <laughs> but here's what they found, and it's really interesting. So here's a, this is the temperature sensor at this weather station. And here it is next to the air conditioning unit exhaust fans and the asphalt parking lot and a cell tower. Here it is st stuck in a box of electronics where it shouldn't be. We were shocked by what we found. Nine of every 10 stations are likely reporting higher or rising temperatures because they are badly sighted, which means the temperature sensor is in a bad place. Their graph of how much this bias might be is impressive. You know, so if they're right, they're saying that, you know, let's even ignore the ones that are just at one degree C, but two degrees centigrade or five degrees centigrade, 69% of stations biased really, really warm by their sighting. Okay? Now the best part of the story is what happens next. A group led by someone in many took these data, which are now publicly available, all the reports, you know, all, the, all the photographs, everything else. They went to the Weather Service and they got them verified or you know, to, to see, are the reports correct? Is there anything wrong with what these volunteers have done? And all the triangles and dots that are filled in here are ones that were actually verified. So the, the triangles are ones that are three, four, or five. So they're supposed to be biased really high here. Lots of them here. So the weather service says, yes, you're right. But that's the raw data. That's the sighting of the, of the, uh, of, of the station itself. What about the data that have been analyzed? Data always have to be analyzed. And I talked earlier about tweaking that has to go on. So they then do this analysis where they have all the stations, the stations with good sites, and the stations with poor sites, and they compare the maximum and minimum temperature readings. And you see that they look almost exactly the same. Now if there's really this high bias, where is it? So what's the answer? How could it possibly be like that? Well, the site exposure problem is real, but the adjustments applied in the data analysis models have already taken that into account. If you take them, the adjusted data, the bias of those badly sighted stations is actually cruel. They've kind of overdone it a bit. <clears throat> so no evidence that the trends in the US are inflated to the poor station site. Now, <coughs> It goes on because Watts and his colleagues then tried to put this into a, a peer reviewed paper and did succeed in that. And this is the Journal of Geophysical Research, a major journal, a really good one. They got it in, but they had to make a lot of changes along the way. And by the time they got it in there, you know, what they find is that the minimum temperatures are overestimated, the maximum temperatures are underestimated, but 
overall, the mean temperature trends are nearly identical across site classifications. Now they're doing another paper now. Um, we'll see where that one goes. The interesting thing about this, and now I'll wrap up here, is you know, what it says about how we do science now. Because here's a situation where we've got somebody who's really concerned that there's a problem with the scientific record. And he's decided to go find out. He enlists an army of volunteers to help. And the important thing about this case is they actually do a good job of that because they use a standard method. Then those data become part of the public record and they can be used by other people to do more studies and really investigate that. In the long run, this may be a good thing. Because now, you know, what it does is say, you know, actually, we've checked and we can trust this record. And we checked it. We did the audit. You see, we did, you know, we are not climate scientists. And we checked and we found out that it was true. Now, Watts isn't going to say that. <laughs> Here's what Watts says. 2014, the, the temperature record, most dishonest year on record. It cannot possibly be the warmest record ever. Um, if you want to look at really good work in this area, one of my favorite websites ever, one of the best examples of science communication I know is this thing called skepticalscience.com, also run by a person who is a, trained as a physicist, but not as a climate scientist, who developed a kind of amateur expertise, and they have a, they go through every skeptic argument, and they'll give you a simple and an intermediate and advanced explanation. It's all uh, based in the peer reviewed literature, it's all linked, so you can get it directly. They, they do some great work with graphics there. This is a really, really valuable site. Uh, Real Climate, of course, is written by climate scientists from you know, based at NASA, GIS. Now, the thing about this is, you know, just to put it in a bigger perspective for a minute and then stop, this idea that everything is open and transparent, everything should be published, even our emails. I don't know about that last part, but the we're, we're in a new world where people perceive that that should be true, that we should publish everything. Funders are requiring it, and that really helps make it happen. So the NSF, the NIH, they will require you, you must, if you're going to submit a grant proposal to these agencies, you have to put in a data management plan that says how you will make the data publicly available, uh, maybe after an embargo period, and then uh, how you will keep them available after your study is done. They aren't going to help you pay for that. You have to take that out of your main budget, but you have to do it. We are seeing lots and lots of publication of source code. In the case of climate models, it's really not obvious why that's a good thing, because these models are often so complicated that uh, even the people who know them best don't understand the whole thing. Many of them have more than a million lines of code now. We're also seeing a lot of open access data here available in many places, including this that came out last year. So data.gov now has a climate data section. It really is just like a catalog of, of, of government sources of data. It doesn't standardize. It doesn't provide you a direct way to download anything, but at least it's a kind of publicly exposed uh, way of getting at them. So, we are doing a lot of questioning. We have people active in science who are not necessarily scientists. People are looking for metadata of all kinds, including things like personal politics. Is that metadata? You know, we need to think about questions like these today. The reason climate audit was so successful is largely the medium. You know, it was an early blog. It was part of a passionate community, that's one thing, but it's also just the medium it reaches a lot of people. And one of the things that's going on now is this idea that peer review is often kind of a corrupt process. Now, I, you know, I'm, I'm on an editorial board and I, I edit a book series. I don't think it's a corrupt process, but it can be seen that way, and sometimes it is. We're seeing uh, now journals sometimes will expose a paper for public comment before it is published. So it used to be the case that they would send it only to experts. In France, a lot of my colleagues, 